Throughout the course of human history, there have been a lot of really great inventors. You have Archimedes, Alberti, Edison, Curie, but for my money, the greatest of them all was the Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> this man took bread, the staff of life, and he stacked it with meat, vegetables, cheese, mustard, you know, ranch dressing if you're a psychopath, but he, he made this delicious, nutritious, portable meal. It is phenomenal. And I am very sad and even upset to report that there has been controversy over the great Earl's work. People have said that he may have been a plagiarist, that there was copyright infringement in his invention. And the evidence for this is that every culture in the world seems to put some carbohydrate next to meat and vegetables and other things. And if you go to Ethiopia, or the Middle East, or all India, you will find naan, or injera, or pita, or something, and they're stacking things on top. And what's more, for about a thousand years, basically, English cuisine was meat or vegetable on a big piece of bread. So, I mean, maybe there is some truth to these claims. However, the Earl gave it a great name. I mean, the sandwich, it's just, it's a perfect word for this delicious food. So maybe 70 years ago, it became fashionable to say that the Trinity is not really a biblical concept. It's, it's much later, it's early third century, it comes from the writings of Tertullian of Carthage, and really it's just this kind of abstruse piece of philosophy superimposed on Christianity, and we should just either get rid of it or just not think about it. It doesn't really matter. But if you talk to people living before the early third century about their understanding of God, they would talk about one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Tertullian did invent this word Trinity, but much like the Earl of Sandwich, he wasn't actually creating something new. He was just giving this helpful portmanteau to carry around this very complex concept of one God who is three persons. So if you asked an early Christian, well, where in the Bible is the Trinity? They might point you to somewhere like today's first reading. So if you were asked, who is the main character of the Bible? You might say, eh, God, I suppose. And then how do the biblical writers First, present God. So in the beginning, we have God creating all that is. Before time, before space, before there is anything, we have God. And then we have what is traditionally translated the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. So it's this, this Hebrew word ruach, the ruach of God, which can be translated wind, as our translation does today, can be translated breath, but almost everywhere else in the Old Testament is just spirit. We have God creating and the spirit of God hovering over the waters. And how does God create? Does he zap things into existence? Does he imagine things and they happen? Instead, he speaks creation into being. We have the world being created through the word of God. And this is the word of God who comes to the prophets and inspires them. This is the word of God who stands over Samuel's bed and cries, Samuel, get up. And he says, Eli, was that you? We have the word of God who the early church fathers say spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, who wrestled with Jacob who led the Israelites in the desert. The same word of God who St. John says took on flesh and dwelt among us. As this tiny baby, as this loving rabbi, as this crucified Messiah. God, the word of God, and the spirit of God. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of my favorite professors in grad school was an Orthodox metropolitan called Callistus Ware. And Callistus Ware pointed out that not only 
is the Trinity not just an abstruse piece of technical theology? Everything we do in life as Christians is done in the name of the Trinity. We are baptized as babies in the name of the Trinity. We start our liturgy, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are buried in our funeral in the name of the Trinity. The Trinity is everything to us. And what's more, he said, you cannot understand the love of God without the Trinity. So in John's first epistle, he tells us that God is love. And in English, we use love in lots of different ways. I love hot dogs. I love golf. I love the Denver Broncos, whatever it is. But in Greek, there are lots of very specific words for different types of love. So you have romantic love, which is one specific word. You have loyalty, which is another word. You have friendship, family love, which is another word. But the word that John uses is none of these. He actually says God is agape, selfless love, love which seeks not its own. Soren Kierkegaard said that most of what we call love is actually a form of selfishness. I love this thing that brings me joy. I love this person who cares about me. I love X, I love Y, because they add value to my life. But agape is selfless love. It is, I love this person even though they could care less about me. I love this person even though they're my enemy, even though they hate me, and I live my life showing them love. So what, Callistus Ware asked, was God loving before the creation? Before there was space, before there was time, before there were any of us, what did God love? So we talk a lot about self-love, self-care, self-compassion, all of which are wonderful things, but it's hard to selflessly love yourself. It doesn't work very well. How do you have agape towards yourself? I don't even care about myself, I love myself so much. It doesn't really work. And so, Callistus Ware says, the Trinity is the showing forth of God's selfless love even before the creation. The love of God, the love that God is, is the love that the Father feels for the Son, that the Son feels for the Spirit, that the Spirit feels for the Father, this perichoresis, this mutual indwelling in the hearts of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the love of God. And the whole creation, our whole world, all of us, we are the result of this outpouring of God's perfect, utter, selfless love. In this Genesis reading, we're also told that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And what does that mean? Well, if God is love, if God's nature is this utter, selfless giving, what if that is the nature in which we are created? What if our humanity, our actual raison d'etre, is to be an outpouring of this same selfless love? What would it be like to take all the loves in your life, pizza, hot dogs, Denver Broncos aside, but actually taking the love that you feel for your children and turning this not into, I love them so long as they don't, totally drive me crazy, or disappoint me, or do something horrible with their lives. But just, I love them, no matter what. What about taking the romantic love that you have in your life, for a partner, for a spouse, and saying, it's not just that we get along, they care about me, they're gonna wheel me around, or they are wheeling me around in my chair at some point, but just, I have this outpouring of love for them. To us, these sound like intuitive goals, good things. But then what about taking that same love and turning it towards friends, towards coworkers, towards strangers, towards people who actively dislike you, mock you, hate you? If your whole life followed the Holy Trinity in this outpouring of selfless love, 
for others? What would your life look like? Maybe in part, it would be a bit like Teresa of Lisieux, who spent her whole life in every moment of drudgery, every awkward conversation, every unpleasant thing, seeking the fullness of love, the fullness of goodness, the fullness of God. Maybe it would look like someone like Martin Luther King or Harvey Milk, who in the face of death, in the face of threats, in the face of everything, would not stop loving others, would not proclaiming love, preaching love, even at the point of death. And best case scenario, it would look like Jesus, who in this total agape, this total selfless love, gives himself to us in the incarnation, gives himself fully to every person on the streets of Jerusalem, gives himself in his death and resurrection, and as our gospel today says, gives himself to all of us until the end of the age. Gives himself to us in our prayer, in our study of his word, in our worship of him. He is fully giving himself to us. To him, to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory until the ages of ages. Amen.